Good evening, everyone. So sadly, we're not convening via our normal Zoom, but I wanted to share some information with you about root crops. And we are also going to include potatoes and sweet potatoes in here this evening. So first of all, what are root crops? Um, they are going to be those underground parts of plants that can include rhizomes, tubers, roots, stems, and leaves. And you can kind of see from that picture there. So some of the reasons to grow root crops is because you get uh, more bang for your buck. You can actually um, eat the tops and the roots of a lot of these crops that you can see listed here. Beets and sweet potatoes, radish, um, garlic, and, and turnips, among others. Uh, another really cool feature about these root crops is that they are cool season crops, some of them, and so that means they can be grown in the spring and in the fall. So if you've already missed the window, maybe for some of these or didn't maybe adequately plan to grow these uh, root crops in your spring or summer garden, uh, then you can certainly do that later into the fall months. So as you can see, most are going to be storage crops. They're going to be able to feed you year round. Just another cool thing. And um, I think it's maybe in later in this month, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, preservation um, ideas and techniques. So you'll get to see some ideas that you can utilize for that as well. So when we talk about successful root crops, one of the primary things to do is to make sure that we have a really loose seed bed. Um, and you hear me talk about turning the dirt into soil all the time. And we're actually going to speak to that in, um, I guess that's actually next week on May 3rd, a little bit more about that. But anytime we have compact soils or any type of rocky soil or any kind of rocks or anything like that, gravel, um, that's of you know, large size, then it can distort the fruit, like you can see here with, with the carrot. Um, carrots are kind of finicky, so anything um, that impedes their growth, then they're just going to halt or they're going to kind of grow around it, like you can see from this picture. Uh, when we think about site selection, again, just that deep well uh, or deep, loose, well-drained soil, uh, we want good air drainage, of course. Typical garden pH, 6.0 to 6.8. I'll work the soil a little bit deeper because again we want to have that fine um, seed bed. If you're growing in, in raised beds just remember that those raised beds are going to warm up a little bit faster this time of year. Um, it will make water management for these root crops a tad bit easier. Um, think about um, site selection again that, that south facing slope we're going to add about 10 to 15 degrees of warmth um, in the winter time so it's going to be warmer this time of year, which is pretty cool. And I keep telling y'all this about the loose fertile soil because that is very, very um, in, important. So even if you're just using a garden fork, just rocking that back and forth to help loosen that up is really going uh, to help. Having high amounts of compost or organic matter in there is really going to help as well. It just makes that soil a little bit more friable. Um, if you have had trouble with specific pests like flea beetles in the past, you can utilize one of those floating row covers and we'll talk more about those here in a few minutes and that's actually going to help keep the temperatures a little bit more stable for um, faster germination and growth um, as well as protecting from from pests. Now it's really impossible to try to sow these one by one, especially carrot seeds. So if you're just broadcast seeding those, just make sure you go back and thin out those um, seedlings so you get adequate airflow. Uh, remember, just like with any other crops that we've talked about, we talked about this in tomatoes a few weeks ago, uh, don't use any type of hot manure or fresh manure uh, because that can lend itself to um, more forking or hairy roots. and, and we don't want that. Uh, we can sow these crops all the way up till September. If you sow carrots um, in, in your summer garden, then you can actually leave them in the ground even past frost and, and be eating fresh carrots for Thanksgiving at least and sometimes even Christmas depending on the weather. Uh, make sure you fertilize via 
um, our charts and I've included that as a, a reference for you to have. But most of the time, as you can see here, two cups of complete fertilizer for every 10 row feed and make sure that you uh, till that in. But like I say, just make sure you refer back to our publication on fertility and, and that'll really um, help get you steered in the right direction for the specific crops. Now, in regard to cold tolerance, it's going to be kind of um, all over the board. We do have some hardy um, tolerance, which can tolerate the heavy frost, which, um, you know, we can still have some of that this time of year. But those are going to be garlics, leeks, uh, multiplier onions, turnips, and radish. And you've probably heard me mention turnips and radish even as a cover crop. And that can also be um, used for pasture grazing even in late fall into the winter months. If they're um, half hardy, they're going to tolerate a light frost. So that's going to be your beets and carrots, parsnips and rutabagas. Um, half tender means that frost will injure the plant. So this is where potatoes are going to fall. And then tender, uh, frost will most definitely kill the plant. So that's going to be your sweet potatoes. So of course we don't want to be planting those slips until later. And then some of those crops that can actually overwinter again, uh, pretty much like the heavy frost there. Um, daikon is a radish that does decompose by midwinter that we will often um, encourage folks that have soil compaction issues to use as a cover crop. And so when they do um, winter kill, they do have quite a proliferous odor, but that just means they're doing their job. So as you can see here again, they do require a little bit cooler weather and you're going to direct seed in spring or late summer and fall. Uh, you can see their autumn temperatures are generally going to be slightly cooler than many of our warm season um, vegetables. So you can plant these a little bit earlier. When we do get into those sustained high temperatures at night, that can affect root development. So be aware that it's not necessarily going to be anything that you're doing. It's just mother nature. Sometimes, you know, we can't control those issues. And then notice there that the sugar content of beets will be lower when it's grown, um, when they're grown in warm weather. And they'll also be lighter in color. And sometimes that's where we will also have that physiological effect of the white banding in beetroot. So again, um, nothing wrong with those. It's just a physiological stress response. And then I've also included this as a resource for you. So you'll kind of have that um, just at an arm's length to kind of remember uh, soil temperatures and all that good stuff for when you need to be planting. Um, you can pre-germinate seeds. It's not always, I mean, necessary, I guess. I mean, we don't really recommend that, but you, you can certainly do that. And you can see there, it just gives those plants a head start. We can soak those seeds overnight in water or even in a, in a moistened paper towel enclosed in a, a plastic bag. And this just kind of gives you the recipe, if you will, for how to perform that task. And again, just a little bit of more continuing there. And um, probably um, an advantage to doing this is that you don't have to thin and oftentimes you'll have less disease pressure. And then fall planting, again, this is going to be in that publication that I've included. It's in the Google Drive and it's also in our web portal um, with the video tonight. So make sure you check those out. And just giving you some um, information how, how to determine the frost free dates for your area. And because so many of us um, on these Monday musings are from all over, that's going to vary depending on where we're at. So make sure um, that you do this by your location. Um, so that's why I'm not going to go into some specific um, math here, but you can kind of see there what that will consist of figuring or figuring out how to do that. I call it frost figuring. And just a few sample calculations for you to work through. And then just remember, uh, I guess maybe a word of caution is that when we sow seeds um, for fall crops, we've gone through uh, a pretty 
hot period of summer. So that soil is gonna be hot and dry. And like you can see here, if we've got a heavy clay content in our soil, it's gonna form that hard crust. And sometimes we'll get this cracking phenomenon. And just again, remember that, you know, root crops, those seeds are gonna need cooler temps and they are gonna require ample moisture for this fall germinating crop um, to get growing. And like, like you see there, beets, carrots, even turnips, all of those are gonna suffer setbacks if the soil is dry. Uh, when you do plant these seeds in, in the summertime, um, it's always a good idea to go ahead and pre-water the soil before sowing after you've worked up that fine seed bed and then sow those seeds later in the afternoon and germination will actually begin overnight, especially radishes, you know, those are up and growing uh, within a couple of days. Um, this time of year in the spring, you can plant those seeds a little bit deeper. Um, if you are in a raised bed or even planting in containers, then you can cover the seeds with potting soil or vermiculite. You can even do that in ground if you, if you want to, but um, just make sure that you keep that soil cool and moist. Um, we want to cover that seeded area uh, with some type of light mulch. Uh, you hear me speak to the advantages of mulch quite frequently in our classes. So also going to be very beneficial for our root crops, but you know, remember it needs to be light, um, light mulch, because we want those to be able to penetrate the soil and come on up. But by providing that mulch, then that's gonna keep those um, soil temperatures and the moisture um, very much consistent. Now here's the floating row covers that I was talking about. Um, you can also utilize these in your cold crops or your brassicas, uh, but these are also going to serve as a, a line of defense for any frost that we might have in the spring or the fall. Uh, you'll notice there too, it also hastens germination. It does offer protection from those tender plants or seedlings from the heat and the sun. Uh, the biggie there is that it's going to exclude pests. And then you can see kind of some different methods that folks have used. Some people just lay it flat on the ground like you see here on the far right. Some people will purchase uh, PVC pipe. Some will just use wire. It just kind of depends on what your setup um, and your situation is as to how you would use this. But this is a relatively inexpensive um, tool to add to your arsenal. Um, this, is, this is something that you can use repeatedly of course, unless you get into some some type of disease issues, but this is something really good to to have on on hand um, throughout your growing seasons. Uh, for those of you um, that remember growing tobacco and tobacco beds, and we would call this remay or tobacco canvas, um, it's pretty much the the same thing. So you can see that light can in fact penetrate it. Water can also penetrate, uh, but it is going to offer protection. And just a couple of pictures there. Um, I've also, I think, mentioned this before in some other classes, making sure that we remove that during the hot part of the day as temperatures start rising as we get later into the season. Um, but if we get into those cooler nights, then of course you can cover that back up or cover to, again, protect from critters. But again, a very cheap tool to have. Uh, when it comes to planting root crops, you can actually um, interplant. Uh, many folks will think that you can't necessarily plant radishes throughout the um, summer months because they need a little bit more shade. And again, it goes back to those cooler temperatures. But once you get an established crop of, say, tomatoes or peppers or something like that, um, you can go back underneath those canopies and sow carrots or radishes. And, and radishes actually germinate a little bit quickly and um, actually they're, I call them the workhorse of the garden and, and we'll speak to that a little bit more next month. One of the companion plants I like to use and, and replant um, throughout the season. And then here we're just looking at some of these grow boxes, cold frames. Um, if you do have one of these, just remember that um, you've got to vent those to let that hot air out. 
Remember that wetter is not better. That's where we get all those disease pathogens um, come in. Um, make sure that you're not compacting any of that soil on the issue or on the inside. And then um, if you do have some of these cold frames, make sure you have a thermometer that's down at the plant level uh, to make sure you always can monitor that pretty easily. So let's just get into a few of these root crops. And we've already talked about some of these and I apologize that I put a lot of words on these slides, but it was just because I wasn't gonna be talking to y'all face to face and I didn't put these in the notes. I just wanted you to be able to have them on, on the slides. But we'll talk more about these as we move through the next few slides. So parsnips and carrots and parsley, all of those are gonna be in the same family. You can see pictures of all of those here. So they're gonna have a lot of the same growing characteristics. Uh, then we have sunflowers, um, sunchokes and salsify that are all in the same family, which is aster. But the sunchokes or Jerusalem artichokes are quite tasty. And that is what you see picture here. You actually eat the root um, of that plant. Oh, and um, if, if anybody has never, or if y'all have never tried salsify, it's also called the oyster plant because it does taste like oysters, just as an FYI. And then we have radish and horseradish, rutabagas, turnips, all of those are going to be in the brassica family. And you can see those pictured here. Of course, mustard is growing pretty prolifically now. Uh, we'll often use the daikons as a cover crop. Again, um, remember if you do plant horseradish, that's one that's going to have or need to have a permanent location um, in your garden because it will come back year after year. Uh, brassicas are known to have some effect as far as uh, being good companions in the garden. And again, this is, this is a group of plants we'll talk more about um, in May as we talk about companions. Then we have beets and spinach and chard. All of these are going to be in the goosefoot family. Now, spinach can be finicky depending on where you're growing and how you're growing it. I discovered that planting for um, a spring and even summer crop of spinach doesn't really work well for me, but I always sow this in the springtime and then it'll just magically sporadically appear in late summer, like in August or September, and it'll just really, really take off and be pretty productive. So, um, or maybe it's just me that I just can't grow spinach, but um, it, it, like I say, it has been known to be a little bit finicky. And of course, garlic, um, we would consider that one of our number one fall crops. So we won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but you'll have this in here just as a reference. I didn't want to leave garlic out because it is um, a very important crop. So it won't be long before we'll actually be harvesting the fruits of our labor. And um, of course, just remember when we do harvest that we're gonna cure those bulbs and you can kind of see how that's been achieved here. Don't cut those tops off until after about two to three weeks and then you can store those. Um, even store those in pantyhose and tie up the knots and then you can just cut one out as you need it. And again, that's something we'll talk about when we, we do our um, preserving the harvest class. So as far as beets, uh, the, like I say, you can eat all parts of this plant. So that's the cool thing is that they were first only leafy. Um, that plant is now known as um, Swiss chard. So beets have actually been a, around a long time. They actually came from Germany, came here in 1806. Um, grow beets full speed, uh, but remember that lack of moisture is gonna cause them to be almost woody. Uh, so they'll be kind of stringy and tough. Um, but one of the biggest problems growing beets is that um, folks will tend to overplant and under thin. So thinning for beets is going to be really critical to get that good size and shape of the beet root, unless you're just specifically growing for the greens. Uh, but lots of different colors now of beets that are on the market. 
And then in regards to carrots, again, they can take several months to mature. There's all kinds of varieties out there, y'all. So many different kinds. Um, the cool thing about carrots is that they came to America with the settlers and the Indians just discovered that they love carrots. So they started cultivating those pretty quickly. Um, you can pretty well mistreat carrots and that's okay. They'll just keep on, on thriving because they're very adaptable, very tolerant, no matter what the weather conditions are through the, through the summer. Again, just remember the whole thing about fresh manure. Uh, we don't want any kind of hot compost to be added because it can make them stringy and tough. Lots of different kinds of carrots. Parsnips are going to be very much uh, grown like carrots. You can leave those in the ground throughout the winter time too. Um, notice that they actually need that cold weather to convert their starches to sugar and that's where they get that sweet nutty flavor from. So parsnips are kind of cool because you can store those. Um, heaving is that phenomenon when we get frost and or freezes in the ground, you know, freezes and thaws, freezes and thaws. So um, that's what's happening. Um, they can tolerate that heaving in the ground, but after you harvest them, you know, they're not going to appreciate that too well. And you can see they're usually kind of underutilized, but again, cooking these like carrots is a really good, good way to do these. The turnip and the rutabaga, the rutabaga is actually a cross between the turnip and a cabbage. So you're still going to get that, um, that same flavor. flavor. They are going to be similar enough to be interchangeable in most recipes. Uh, when you cook, uh, the flesh of turnip turns from white to almost translucent, but the rutabaga will actually turn like this bright vivid yellow orange. Uh, rutabagas are also going to be a little bit rougher in texture and have that tougher skin and also a little bit bigger and more firm than turnips. And um, if you don't like the bitterness or the taste of turnips, you might like rutabagas because they're a little bit sweeter in flavor. Radishes are going to be a great beginner crop because they do germinate so quickly. Here's the daikons, the white radishes. Some people will actually eat these. Um, like I say, I typically will recommend these more for cover crops, but they are edible. And then celery egg. Um, this is also known as the celery root. So if you have a wet space in your garden, this will really take off and, and flourish for you. It does have a really nice soft celery flavor and you can eat it raw or cooked. And then even the greens are edible uh, with that celery flavor as well. And then onions, we got this wide range of onions. First of all, they're the second most important crop worldwide after tomatoes. So um, I just kind of threw that in as your did you know uh, fact for the week. Uh, but you can grow onions, you can grow the tops in cool weather. They're going to form those bulbs during the warm weather. They're short day and long day varieties. It's just kind of depending on the day length of what kind that you actually uh, grow. They're going to be heavy feeders. Remember that. As far as Northeast Tennessee, the short day are going to be the most popular that are going to be grown here. Uh, the yellow Bermuda onions are going to be famous anywhere in the south. But if you start these in the fall, you're going to get a little bit better bulb, um, bulb formation. And onion sets are going to be a little bit more reliable, just as an FYI when you're getting started with onions. So um, sometimes we'll get the question, what is a green onion? Well, um, any onion can be used as a green onion. It's just all about how you harvest. So a green onion is when you actually harvest that bulb when it's small. And this, of course, can be grown from those sets that you plant in your garden. And the commercial green onion variety is always going to be a white onion. Now, remember that bunching onions don't produce bulbs. They're going to form new shoots throughout the growing season and it's pretty prolific and they can be very winter hardy. They'll continue to produce throughout the season and then those shoots are going to have a crisp and mild taste early season but the later we get they're going to be really pungent and 
everybody around you is going to know you've, you've had a bunch of onions. Uh, notice there at the bottom that scallions are actually um, going to be referred to several different kinds of onions, but usually they're going to be applied to the non bulbing types like those bunching onions. And of course, chefs are going to prefer uh, scallions over green onions because they are going to have that more delicate flavor, unless of course it's later in to the season. Um, many people um, in the South will also grow potato onions or the multiplier onions. You kind of see what those look like there. One thing about these is that you don't want to over cook those because um, that stinky factor goes up, but you can actually drop those onions in boiling water for about 10 seconds and drain and chill those and then the skin actually will just slip right off of those. And anytime you're working with onion, you can use stainless steel to um, rub on your hands and that'll take that odor off or just rub with salt or vinegar will also help with that. And just some more pictures there that you can see. These are, well, these are leeks actually planted in spring and harvested in the fall. And again, these are going to be long growers, about 140 days. They're not going to bulb. You can kind of see that, you know, from that picture there. And um, the French will actually call these asparagus for the poor. And I put in this little box down there, onion shallots and leeks are not considered interchangeable when it comes to cooking. So whatever your recipe calls for, then use that because otherwise it could alter um, the taste or the flavor of your recipe. Um, shallots, um, these are just going to be a form of those multiplier onions. So they're going to look like small tulip bulbs. They will not set seed, which um, some people really like that, uh, but they can overwinter in the garden as a perennial. But you know, kind of being finicky with, you know, mother nature with the weather, many folks will actually lift those bulb at the end of the season and then replant later in the fall. And just kind of see there how to grow those. And I put this in just so you'll have it as a quick reference, kind of what we talked about there. And then here is the salsify, pretty much just a skinnier relative of the parsnip. It is in the dandelion plant family, and again, known as the oyster plant, and it is a cool weather root crop. But it also has that really pretty bloom on it, too, if you allow it to go to flower. And then these are the sunchokes, or Jerusalem artichoke. So they're actually considered a tuber. Um, this is one that the Native Americans utilized frequently. Um, one bad thing about this, for some people, some people aren't going to mind this, but you know, you see these on the roadways and the medians and things. So this is to be a uh, plant considered by some as invasive. If you like that crunch in stir fries with water chestnut, they're going to have pretty much that same texture and flavor. If you're deliberately planting these, then plant them in the springtime. Just a, a few notes on pests. Radishes will incur flea beetles, but they can serve as a trap crop for flea beetles for you as well. Um, all summer long, if you have other cold crops growing, um, plant, you know, places uh, or plant um, <laughs> radishes places in your garden. And that again can kind of serve as a trap crop for them. They'll go to those radishes, but they'll leave some of your other crops alone. Now, if you're really wanting to eat, you know, the radishes, then that's where like the row cover would, would come in handy. Um, carrots, of course, the carrot flies and then lettuces, the slugs love them. So, you know, you can put out little beer cups for the slugs to, to drown in or even using dye pail would be something you could scatter those granules. You could scatter around the perimeter of your lettuce beds. So I did put a few companions in here, but again, we'll talk more about this in a few weeks. Uh, but onions, leeks, and herbs, uh, such as rosemary, wormwood, and sage, are actually going to act as repellents to the carrot fly. Uh, beets, they're going to grow very well near bush beans, so think blue lake beans. Um, onions and kohlrabi, but they don't like pole beans, so be very careful with that. 
Uh, lettuce and brassicas are also going to be good companions for beets. Lettuce, you can actually interplant that with strawberries. You can grow this um, between your cucumber plants and carrots, but especially like in, in between your cucumbers, as the cucumbers start getting a canopy on them, you can go back and sow lettuce in, in between and be harvesting lettuce even up into the summer because that will shade that out and keep them, keep it producing. Um, keep lettuce away from cabbage though because it is a deterrent to the growth and flavor of lettuce just as an FYI. And then as far as onions um, and all members of the cabbage family, they're going to get along pretty good together. So beets, strawberries, tomatoes, lettuce, summer savory, and even chamomile are going to do well. Um, onions don't like peas and beans though, so keep those separate in the garden. Um, ornamental relatives of the onion um, can serve as a protective companion for roses. But you see there, onion maggots can travel from plant to plant when you set those in a row. So don't plant them all in a row, kind of scatter them throughout your garden and it kind of alleviates some of that problem. So you can, you know what I'm going to say next. That's why that garden journal is so important. Keep all of, all of this written down um, because you may not know if the onion maggot is an issue that you have. But um, if you do incur that issue, then you'll know next year kind of to intersperse your plants throughout your garden. And you heard me refer to the workhorse um, radishes. They can help protect squashes from squash borers. Um, they can deter against cucumber beetles and rust flies. Now I will tell you, cucumber beetles are one of the worst issues I have. Um, I plant radishes just all summer long and um, I don't I don't know if I'm really getting any effect with the cucumber beetles but you know we have had pretty high populations of these the last couple of years so I just want you to know I, I do think that they're a work a workhorse in the garden but I don't know about those cucumber beetles y'all. Um, chervil and nasturtium they can actually improve the radish growth and flavor makes them a little bit sweeter and uh, you can plant radishes around corn and just let the radishes go to seed and that helps fight the, the corn borers. Um, snowbell radishes are a favorite of flea beetles. So when I was talking about planting a trap crop, um, then this is one that they're gonna prefer. And you can plant like your cherry bell, uh, snowbell, flea beetles will typically go to the snowbell first. If you have spinach and have leaf miners as a problem, then they can lower those leaf miners away <laughs> Excuse me. And then as far as hyssop, cabbage, cauliflower, any of the brassicas, um, maybe kind of keep radishes away from, from those. And then the other cool thing is that radishes are a good indicator of calcium levels in the soil. So if radish grows and only produces a really stringy root, then you know you need calcium. And remember, calcium is one of those issues that can affect some of our other summer veggie crops. Um, as far as blossom end rot, which we know that that's also um, water fluctuations in the soil as well, but um, calcium, you know, can affect that. So if you start seeing this issue early on with some of your radishes, then adding calcium to your soil would be really good. And it's going to promote the health of your other veggies as you move through the summer. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit more uh, just about potatoes here. Uh, it's kind of cool. I put all this on here for your reference in regard to the historical information because it is considered an ancient veggie. Um, it was first cultivated by the Incas in Peru. They are still considered a cool season crop even though they're just moderately frost hardy, but they grow really fast and basically they're just a thickened stem. So notice here, um, a potato plant doesn't produce new potatoes right off the seed potato that you plant. Um, it actually sends up a shoot that becomes the green plant um, above the ground. And as that plant grows, it produces runners. And that's where the new potatoes develop on this plant. So you can kind of see this schematic here of how that's working. So basically that seed potato that you plant, it dissolves in the soil because it's actually providing the food and nutrition for this developing plant. So that's why we do plant um, potatoes in, in a deep hole or trench those potatoes in a furrow. 
Um, it's not a, a root, it's a tuber. So that's just an underground storage system, very nutrient dense. Again, they can withstand a light frost. Um, if we do have compaction as an issue, then we're going to get those misshapen tubers. So just um, remember that. Um, if you do have a really heavy clay soil, of course, amending that with organic material in, in the fall to get you ready for spring will be uh, very beneficial and time saving for you in the long run. Uh, notice here that we don't want to add lime or manure because that's going to raise our soil pH. And when we raise the soil pH for potatoes, then that increases the occurrence of scab. So if you were in class last week, then I showed you some pictures of scab. And I told you they're still edible. It's just a physiological response. Well, this is why it's just that soil pH and high nitrogen is going to cause that. Um, as far as crop rotation, plant potatoes where you previously had legumes. And just as an FYI, even though we don't necessarily grow potatoes the same as we do tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, they're all in the nightshade or solanaceous family. Um, I'm sure most of you know this, but potatoes are going to form those tubers about four to six inches below the soil surface. And then when those stems um, actually reach about eight inches, you're going to pull that soil up around the plant and you're going to cover that lower portion of the stem. And what that's going to do is force new potatoes to grow above those seed potatoes that you planted in the furrow. And then you'll just repeat this process every couple of weeks. Make sure that you keep those potatoes covered um, because we can get some green like you see here. And that's just when those potatoes are gonna be um, exposed to sunlight. So that's another reason pulling that um, soil up is going to be so critical. When uh, tubers form, it's actually gonna be when those soil temps are about 60 to 70 degrees consistently. When we get to temperatures about 80 degrees or a little bit higher, then that's when tuber formation stops. Um, if you mulch, you are reducing soil temperature, um, but a six inch layer of straw is gonna keep the soil temps 10 degrees lower. And then again, make sure you're always rotating your crops. Uh, potatoes are gonna be drought sensitive, so you wanna keep those consistently moist, um, especially as they flower and then right after flower flowering because this is when the tubers are actually setting. Now going back to this um, mulch or the six inch layer of straw, uh, many people will actually plant a living mulch or a green manure. Um, I've even known folks to plant alyssum. So alyssum, which is an annual flower, um, you can, for lack of a better word, tromp on it. Or, or whatever, but um, it, it's not going to hurt it, but it's actually going to provide you a living mulch. So pretty inexpensive to do that too. Uh, you can grow potatoes in containers. Just remember that drainage is going to be an issue. Um, Burtelette bags or you know, any of those, um, you know, grocery totes. I'm not sure what that material is. It's not really burlap. It's not really mesh, but you know, like the, the free tote bags that you get for conferences that you attend or the grocery bags and stuff, um, because they still allow water to, to drain through and sunlight to permeate. Um, garbage cans, um, even bathtubs and laundry baskets, and even with the holes in them, they will um, produce potatoes. Now, you're not going to get the size of potatoes that you would in ground, but you're going to have baby potatoes to eat on throughout the season. Notice here that you just keep filling your container with soil as that plant continues to grow. Uh, many people have started um, utilizing the tire method and you kind of see how they've just stacked them up. They'll plant the seed in this bottom tire and then they'll just keep putting a tire on and filling it with soil as that plant grows. And I have put the recipe, if you will, uh, for how to create a pot potato part. I can't talk tonight. A potato tire system. Um, so you can just follow this step by step. 
uh, you can use straw instead of soil. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't a believer in this initially, but um, I've done this a couple of times and it really does work y'all. So you can use the hay bale, you can create um, something out of panels like you see here. Um, again, the laundry baskets or trash cans, any kind of tote. Again, if you're using a tote, just make sure you have drainage. But again, you've just got, um, you've got step-by-step step here how to do that. The cool thing about utilizing straw is that you don't have to, to dig. Um, the other, I guess, maybe advantage or even some people would see it as a con is that you're having to continually place straw, but it does break down pretty quickly. And then chitin. Um, I like to use that word because everybody thinks I'm saying something else. Ha ha. Uh, but um, chitin is sprouting. And I put this in here for you as well, just how to chit, which is to get your potatoes to, to sprout and, and what all this does involve. Our ancestors um, did this uh, for years. Notice here that chitting uh, reduces the time from planting to harvest by a couple of weeks. So it actually is going to, you know, promote a little bit faster growing, which is cool. So again, you'll have um, this step-by-step -step to kind of guide you through, along with a video that shows you step-by-step -step how to do that. So just click on that and it will show you that video. Um, planting, most of you are probably past the time for planting potatoes. Um, my grandpa always used to say do it on Good Friday, no matter when Good Friday fell. But no matter, always use certified seeds because they're going to be de disease resistant. So don't just use potatoes out of your pantry, y'all, because we want to make sure that we're not going to have disease issues to contend with. Um, notice here, if the soil is waterlogged when you dig, um, potatoes will probably rot before they even get started. And when I say when you dig, that should say when you plant. Sorry about that. But um, this is going to incur a lot of disease pressure if that soil is waterlogged. Um, but anyway, oh, here's the other thing I want to make make sure when you do um, cut your seed potatoes, <clears throat> they're going to form a callus over that cut, and that's going to help protect that potato from rotting once you do plant it. Some people will utilize sulfur. You can see here in this picture below, um, some of you hear me talk about sulfur and, and copper pretty frequently in a lot of, of classes and that can help you protect those potatoes. Um, I will liken it to being uh, like an immune system booster. But you'll notice here after you make those cuts, that's when you want to uh, shake them up in a bag because it's gonna stick since that um, cut is still pretty fresh. As far as planting, I did put um, aminocloprid is the active ingredient in this product call it, called Admire. Um, if you have Colorado potato beetle issues, um, this is going to provide you season long control. Now, another one that I did not put in here is spinosad, which is going to be an organic material. You can also utilize that. But what you do is actually spray that in furrow um, after you get your seed potatoes in the row. And then you won't have issues with the potato beetles. Um, this is kind of an expensive product. So years ago when it was first labeled uh, for potatoes, home gardeners would go in and, and kind of share this because a little dab will do you and it, it literally will last four years. Um, you'll notice here um, as far as planting, I put some tips for growing baby potatoes. Um, you can put those a little bit closer together. When you do place the potatoes in the trench, you're going to do them cut side down. And remember that we're not going to fill this trench in completely, but you notice how deep that trench is. So definitely want to have that trench that deep. When it comes to harvesting, it's when that foliage turns yellow and it starts dying back. So this is not a disease. This is actually 
um, telling you, the plant's telling you it's, it's time, time to dig. Uh, this is when we want to stop watering because that's going to allow those tubers to mature for a week or two before you do, in fact, harvest. And just some um, tips on digging. Uh, remember, new potatoes are going to be ready for harvest about 10 weeks. That's usually going to be in early July, which is pretty cool. You can have potatoes all season long, uh, but all this is pretty much common sense. Uh, just make sure that when you do dig potatoes and store those, don't store with apples because ethylene gas will cause your potatoes to spoil. And then don't ever wash those. So when you do dig, um, don't wash them. Do that right before you use them. So we talked about um, scab last week, uh, too much organic matter, uh, wet conditions, and then high nitrogen is all going to contribute to this um, likelihood. Um, if you do utilize organic matter and stuff, make sure you incorporate that because um, that's, that's where this occurrence is going to come from if it's actually touching those high amounts of organic matter. We don't want it contacting those newly forming um, potatoes. Uh, leaf hoppers, I talked about this one last week just very briefly. Um, this is the the insect that vectors bacterial scorch in oak trees. So we have many different kinds of leaf hoppers, but anytime we see this curling damage, um, we'll usually think of one of two things. It's either 2,4-D injury or leaf hoppers. Flea beetles, you're going to get a lot of this speckling on the leaf, but oftentimes you're going to see the little flea beetles and they're uh, little black beetles and they jump just like fleas. And you can kind of see here those little white streaks. I should have blown that picture up a little bit better so you can see that. Or just the small holes. And here's our favorite Colorado potato beetle. Uh, notice here the biggie is that they do overwinter in the soil as adults because that's what beetles do. Uh, beetles are grub worm larvae. Um, I put a handout in there for control, but I kind of like this little picture I put in here. Just try to kill me because they will. They'll just stand up and laugh at you if you don't get something in the furrow at planting. <coughs> a lot of resistance is built up to this um, with this insect over the last 30 or 40 years. We talked about um, early and late blight in uh, tomatoes a few weeks ago, but it being in the same family, potatoes being in the same family as tomatoes, then of course we're still going to have some of these blight issues. So they're going to present very much like what we talked about in the tomato class. So um, the Irish potato famine was actually a result of um, the blight. So um, again, it um, starts from the bottom and works its way up the plant and it moves really, really fast. And anytime we have those wet, humid conditions, that's going to make um, the, the spores more prolific in, in regards to spreading. Rotate every year, um, at least every couple, no, you know, at least every third year, but um, any of your solanaceous crops are gonna be a little bit more cantankerous in regards to soil. Um, issue. So rotating every year, especially again, um, follow legumes. Any of your bean crops is a good practice. And I'll just put some varieties here for you to have and some comments so you can refer back to these. These all perform very well here in Northeast Tennessee. I've also put your companion list in here just a little you know, quick snapshot. You'll get more information on this in a couple of weeks, but just to kind of have handy. And just some pictures there to kind of show you. Now the larva, these little critters, I'm telling you they're the antichrist. Um, we get lots of questions about uh, planting by the sign, so I'll just put some information here <coughs> for you in regard to that. So uh, it kind of goes back to what we talked about in January as far as the farmer's almanac. Um, you know, I grew up with some of these philosophies, but just know that, you know, this is not like any kind of research 
um, based information, but I just wanted to share it with you in case this is of interest to you. And then from potatoes, we'll move into sweet potatoes. And we do have some differences in regard to sweet potatoes and yam. Yam, so I always kind of like to uh, point those out and you can kind of see here how I've written, written these out. Um, the cool thing with um, yams, originally from Africa and hardly sold in US markets. So you're not gonna truly see these um, here in the US. Notice here that yams are actually gonna be toxic when you eat those raw, but they're safe when they're cooked. Um, that goes back to some of those glycosides. Um, if, if some of you attended the phytochemistry of herbs last year, then you might remember some of that. Um, yams, some of those flesh can be purple, very low GI index, which is good for diabetics. But sweet potatoes is what we have here. Tuber's root um, with that sweet, moist flesh. You're going to have thin and pale to dark and thick as far as the, the skin. Um, flesh can also be purple and also um, beneficial. Um, well, actually, um, I had a friend of mine in Middle Tennessee that one time told me, and I don't know if this is accurate, but he said that you could just eat sweet potatoes because they had your daily uh, quantity of vitamins and minerals and you could just live off sweet potatoes. So I don't know, I never investigated that, but there's a little FYI for you. And there's kind of what the difference is between those. And again, yams are not sweet potatoes. They're not even in the potato family. They are actually um, in the morning glory family. And notice we got about a hundred different cultivars that are gonna be available. Whoa, I'm not sure what that's doing, but anyway. Um, yeah, 300% of the recommended daily intake of vitamin A. Vitamin A is fat soluble. So eat with butter. Of course, when we plant sweet potatoes, we do that much differently than how we plant potatoes. So we plant slips and slips are those shoots that are grown from a mature sweet potato. And some people actually try to do this on their own, um, myself included, just taking toothpicks and kind of hanging it over a cup. And, um, but again, purchase slips where they're actually certified and disease free. Uh, you can get 10 to 12 bushels of disease free sweet potatoes, um, bed those are bedded to produce enough slips for, for an acre um, if you're really into sweet potatoes. You want to bed those about seven weeks before field setting time. But if you purchase the slips and then plant, you'll be good to go. Oh, I forgot that I'd put this in here so you can actually see how to kind of do that if you want to try this on your own at, own at home. Um, also step by step for how to, to achieve that. Um, these are going to be the varieties and cultivars that we know perform well and gives you um, skin, flesh, yield, all that good, good stuff. And of course, sweet potatoes, they're going to um, perform a little bit better in those sandier soils. That's why we'll see uh, the commercial scale production of these usually take a place on the coast in some of those sandier soils. Uh, notice there, if we do grow those in heavier soils, the roots may be a little bit rough skinned and, and irregular. Again, don't have high organic matter. So this is completely opposite of what I usually talk to y'all about, uh, especially for fruit crops. But <clears throat> sweet potatoes, we don't want that high organic matter. And remember to rotate as well and make sure that you're planting these after any threat of frost. Oh, and you can plant these using like a tobacco setter if you're planting a lot. I have friends that plant a lot of sweet potatoes, even though um, they just have a, a little garden, they'll do a lot of sweet potatoes. Again, a, um, a fine seed bed by tilling is going to be probably one of the best things to do um, before you plant those slips and then make sure you're, that you're watering well. Don't let those dry out. Uh, as far as the root formation, that's gonna begin in about 30 to 45 days. So 30 days after you set your slips, that's when you want to, to side dress. Um, if you get into some 
in, um, insect issues. Seven is usually, um, if you're conventional, that's going to be our first line of defense. Um, but sometimes it won't be necessary, but just know that we'll start out with a seven if we need to spray. As far as harvesting, just being gentle with those. Um, a mature sweet potato sprout's gonna have four to five roots. You're gonna have different sizes like you see here, but you'll just gently lift those sprouts and their roots out with the shovel. Uh, make sure they don't become detached from the vine. That way, if they're not um, mature, you can just lower those back into the ground. Don't leave those sweet potatoes exposed um, to direct sunlight for more than 30 minutes when you do harvest because they'll sun scald. And that's going to make them susceptible to root rot during storage. storage. <coughs> They're going to bruise really easily, so you want to handle these pretty cautiously. We want these to be able to store for a longer period of time. So kind of in tandem with that, curing um, is really going to be necessary because that's going to improve flavor and texture. And um, anything that we might have damaged on that plant during harvest, that actually allows that plant to heal. But when we cure those um, potatoes, it's actually going to increase our storage ability. And again, we're going to talk about some of those storage options in a, you know, next month. Uh, we're going to protect the root from storage diseases. It's just going to increase that post-storage lifetime. You'll notice there um, that should be 85 degrees, not 850 degrees, just FYI, uh, but a relative humidity of about 80 to 90 percent. So after you get those uh, sweet potatoes cured, you can store for four to seven months. Just make sure that it's well ventilated and you're going to clean by brushing or washing. Um, and then sometimes if you purchase sweet potatoes, you'll notice that they've been waxed. Um, but of course, that's probably something I wouldn't recommend for us as, as home gardeners. But if you ever see that, um, sometimes they, uh, commercial growers will do that. Uh, don't store sweet potatoes in the refrigerator because you'll get a hard center and they just won't taste good. So again, well ventilated, uh, cool, dry container. Store those in a basement or a root cellar. Uh, you don't want any kind of strong heat source and you can store for about two weeks if you store those properly. If you uh, like okra, plant okra next to your sweet potato. They're mutually beneficial to one another. Oh wow, I didn't even like realize that I was right at the end. Okay, so that was a really quick synopsis of our root crops with a little bit of a focus on potatoes and sweet potatoes. So you um, are getting publications on all three of those, as well as a couple of additional publications in regard to fertility, uh, planting dates, you know, with the soil temperatures and that kind of thing um, as well. So I hope this has helped. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to reach out. You see my email there. You should be able to just click on it um, in the PowerPoint presentation. I mean, in the in the notes and the slides um, that I'm sending you to. Or you can go to our Ask Us portal as always, and those links are going to be included in your email. So I hope that all of you have a fantastic week, and I hope you're considering growing some of these root crops, especially some of those odd ones. Salsify, y'all, you really got to try that one. Um, and try parsnips. They're really all good mixed together, all the root crops mixed together. And and roasted in the oven, so um, very tasty, especially if you add celery -ac, um, to those as well. You get that instant boost of flavor. But anyway, I will see y'all next week on May 3rd, and um, I can't remember what our topic is right off, but uh, oh yeah, soil, summer soils, and that's when we're talking about the three C's, cover crops, companions, and composting. So we're going to do a really quick um, snapshot of all of those just to get you growing well as um, springtime planting nears. So have a great week y'all and I'll see you next week.